It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, it's Tyler here. William Leg Craig is by far one of the most popular Christian apologetics on the internet. And matter of fact, for this whole entire video, what I'm going to do is to respond to his claim that there's evidence that Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead. Now, before I begin my whole entire response video, I first want to state that I am not a Christian. So my personal perspective is probably different than somebody else watching this video and vice versa. However, judging entirely by the whole entire argumentation that he has done, I haven't found the whole entire argumentation to be very convincing. And so, without further hesitation, let us respond to the video and get my personal thoughts and reaction to all of this. Fact number one, after his crucifixion, Jesus was buried in a tomb by a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin named Joseph of Arimathea. This fact is important because it means that the location of Jesus' tomb was known in Jerusalem to both Jew and Christian alike. New Testament scholars have established the historicity of this fact on the basis of evidence such as the following. Number one, Jesus' burial is attested multiply in early independent sources. This is one of the most important criteria that historians use for establishing historical facts. If an event or a saying is attested in multiple sources which are independent of each other and at least one of which is early, then it is much more probable to be historical rather than made up. I noticed that Mr. Craig had made different presuppositions. The first one is that the Bible is true. Number two, the Gospels claim that the Bible and the resurrection is true. Therefore, the Bible is true and that Jesus, in fact, rose from the dead. This type of logic is just circular reasoning. It starts on the premise that something is true, therefore that something also must be true. And it's really stupid reasoning right here. Because for starters, let's go back like a long time ago and look at the history of the various texts for the Old in the New Testament. For starters, the New Testament was written at least 40 years after the fact of the supposed resurrection. And so over 40 years, people just gathered the information through the word of mouth. And so for 40 years, people were just saying that Jesus, you know, just rose from the dead. However, the problem with this sort of testimony by hearsay and the word of mouth is that details over a gradual period of time could just easily be manipulated. And so what someone said in the past might be different than the present. And so that alone is not, in fact, reliable evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And number two, most modern day scholars do in fact agree that the Gospels, as written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Paul, were all just anonymous authors. In fact, we have no idea who exactly are these types of people. And not just that though, but back in the time when Jesus Christ was alive, he probably had spoken like Aramaic during that time period. And so, you mean to tell me that the people who wrote down the Gospels, who know nothing about Aramaic, could just easily like write down Greek in that kind of text? And not just that though, but the copies of the Gospels that we have today are based entirely upon copies upon copies upon copies. There's like no sort of original text that we actually know about when it comes down to the Gospels. Now here's a data chart and most scholars agree that of all the Gospels out there that Mark came before Luke and Matthew. Now 76% is unique to Mark 
while 80% is actually through Mark and Matthew, and 3% is through Mark and Luke. Now for the Luke part, it seems as still that 41% of Luke comes directly from Mark, and that 35% is unique to Luke, and that of course the double tradition is about 23% for Luke. And finally for Matthew, 46% of it is actually comes directly from Mark, while 24% comes from double tradition, and that 20% is actually unique to Matthew. Although there are clear differences between the Gospels, when I was just rereading them, it seemed as though that there were like entire sections that I noticed that were word to word and copy by copy. This comes directly from Mark 14, 38. Watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. When you go to Matthew 26, 41, it's the exact same text. Now in Mark 6, 41, it states that taking the fire loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave stinks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. In Luke 9, 16, it's the exact same thing. Now, I'm not going to accuse the writers for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Paul as plagiarists because the very idea of plagiarism did not exist back then. As a matter of fact, it was quite common for people to just borrow or just take inspiration from various texts around their surroundings. As a matter of fact, if you were to compare the various aspects of the Epic of Gilgamesh to the earlier stories of Genesis, you'll find that there's like a lot of text that is like really similar of like the Epic of Gilgamesh and Genesis. And so the ideas of like borrowing or having influence of different texts or mythology was pretty common back then. However, as far as the whole entire idea that there are like the accounts of the tomb, let's check out the various accounts and compare the various accounts as defined by the authors. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back some of the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like a dead man. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lies. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead, and going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, now I have told you. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the man said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still with you in Glacy, the Son of Man must be delivered over the hands of the sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salame brought spices so they might go over to anoint Jesus' body. Very early the first day of the week, just at the sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and asked each other, who would roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that from the tomb, which was very large, has been rolled away. After they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus of Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. 
but go, tell his disciples and Peter, he was going to go into you into Galici. There you will see him just as he told you. Early on on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know what he had put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the stripes of the linen laying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the stripes of linen laying there, lying in his place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciples, who have reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. As you guys can see, the various accounts of the resurrection just seem to just contradict each other. Like I said earlier, a lot of the stuff that was written down was 40 years after the fact. And not just that though, but because they were largely based entirely off of oral traditions, it's obvious that like a lot of the details just gonna, you know, change from person to person depending on the sources that the writers got it from. And so not just that though, the people who were the disciples of Jesus Christ during his time when he was alive were not even there at the event and neither were the writers of the Gospels. And so it's based upon 40 plus years of just hearsay. We don't know the writers of the Gospels and in fact the copies that we have right now are just copies upon copies upon copies based upon copies. And so I'm just kind of curious, how is this evidence that the resurrection actually happened? If the Bible is the inherent word of God, why would something like this have such glazing errors as something as fundamental as the resurrection? Jesus' burial is mentioned in the very old tradition, which is quoted by Paul in his first letter to the church in Corinth. Paul wrote, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. And then he begins to quote this formula that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas or Peter then to the twelve. Paul here not only uses the typical rabbinical technical terms received and delivered with regard to the tradition that he hands on, but these verses are a highly stylized four-line formula filled with non-Pauline characteristics. This has convinced all scholars that Paul is, just as he says, quoting from an old tradition which he himself received and in turn passed on to his converts in Corinth. This tradition probably goes back at least to Paul's fact-finding visit to Jerusalem in AD 36 when he spent two weeks with Peter, Jesus' chief disciple, and with James, Jesus' younger brother, according to Paul's letter to the Galatians. On the positive side of things, it's safe to say that we do know for a fact that Paul existed, unlike Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where the accounts are in fact anonymous writers, Paul himself did in fact refer to himself during his letters. And what's so interesting about Paul is the idea that he was actually a really edgy boy before becoming a part of Christ and actually preaching about Christianity. For you have heard in my previous way in life in Jerusalem how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Jerusalem beyond of my own age among my people and extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. What's also interesting is that Paul saw a stoning but he did not do anything about it. Right here it says, at they covered their ears and yelling on the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, 
drag them out of the city and begin to stone them. Meanwhile, the witness laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul's a reference to Paul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep, and Saul approved of their killing him. So while it's true that Paul is in fact a real person, the reality is, according to his own accord, that he was not there during the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The only way that Paul saw Jesus Christ was literally a hallucination according to his own accord. For what I receive, I pass unto you of the first importance that Jesus died for his sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Capus and then appeared to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of them are still living they'll somehow fall in asleep. He then appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me too. Like I said earlier, Paul himself did not see the resurrections. None of the twelve disciples saw the resurrections. James himself did not see the resurrections. They're literally basing the claim off of other people's what they just said even though they themselves were not eyewitnesses. And not just that though, but it claims that more than 500 people apparently saw Jesus at the same time. However, I think this whole entire process could be, you know, explained away by the science that we know today. In a mass hysteria, people of a group start to believe that they might be exposed to something dangerous such as a virus or a poison they believe a threat to be real because someone says so or because it fits their experience. Due to the threatening delusion, a large group of people get collectively very upset. So more or less, Paul did not see Jesus rising from the dead. There was like 500 people he said that saw Jesus, but they of course did not saw him right from the dead. Like the disciples were not even there to see Jesus rise from the dead. And of course, the accounts on which the people saw Jesus rising from the dead all have contradictory accounts on their own personal records. And of course, the authors were anonymous authors who, again, were not first hit accounts. So, more or less, the evidence that Jesus just rose from the dead seems very shoddy to me. Incredibly shoddy. Now, when you recall that Jesus was crucified in A.D. 30, that means that this tradition goes back to within the first five years after Jesus' death. So short a time span and such personal contact with the eyewitnesses make it idle to speak of legend in this case. This again assumes that the gospel is so true because the Gospels are true. However, like I said before, nobody saw the resurrections. Not Paul, not the 12 disciples, apparently like, you know, depending on the accounts, maybe Mary and some other woman, but even then, the accounts of the resurrections are so contradictory that they kind of cancel themselves out. That said, however, it seems as though that the claim that Jesus' body is in a tomb only comes directly from the Bible. And honestly, and I'm not trying to trick anybody watching this video, but is there any sort of record outside the Bible that actually confirms that they put his body in a tomb? Because I'm searching and searching and searching, and so far, I cannot find any type of Roman record that actually shows and demonstrates that they did in fact put Jesus' body in a tomb or that they crucify him. And so I'm not trying to, you know, try to trick people or anything like that. I'm just saying I never saw any sort of evidence outside the Bible. <laughs> no other competing burial story exists. 
if the burial by Joseph of Arimathea were fictitious, then we would expect to find either some historical trace of what actually happened to Jesus' corpse, or at least some competing legends. But all of our sources are unanimous on Jesus' honorable interment by Joseph. That is simply not true. Prior to the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, there has been plenty and plenty of dying and rising gods that existed throughout the ages. In fact, for this whole entire example, I'm going to use a biblical god that is like reference in the Bible as evidence of a dying and rising God that existed prior to Jesus Christ. While Israel was slain at Shittim, the men began to have sex with a Moabite woman who invited the people to the sacrifices offered to their gods. The people ate the meat from the sacrifices and worshipped the gods. Since the Israelites joined in worshipping the god Baal of Por, Yahweh became angry with Israel. What people don't really know about the Bible was that towards the beginning chapters of the various books that it was very much polytheistic because there were like a lot of references to the various ancient Canaanite gods that people had worshipped. For example, the god El Elyon, there was also references to Ashura, there's references to Yahweh, and there's also references to Baal. Now gradually over a period of time they made Yahweh as the main god of the Bible and the rest apparently because he was mad about the idol worship they decided to get rid of those gods and it's like really evident to me that the early beginnings of Christianity at least the Bible was very polytheistic before monotheistic and so the idea that the Christians have for God nowadays seem very deistic in comparison to the past. But anyway, the main reason why I brought up the idea of Baal for the God is because he also had a similar resurrection like Jesus Christ. How has Elian, the Lord, died? How has Paris Zibu, Lord of the Earth, like the longing of a young cow for a calf, like the longing of an Evie for a lamb, so was the longing of Aha for the shine of Baal. And he, Elian the Lord, lives, and he, Zubu, Lord of the earth, exists in a favorable dream, El heard. Good tidings, O my son, who I begotten, the heavens shall run oil, the valley shall flow with honey, and I know that Elian the Lord lives. Now, it's quite obvious to me that the writers of the New Testament are very sophisticated people and are well educated. Because remember, back then, many people could not read or write. And so that's why they use hearsay as a way to continue a story over years upon years upon years. And so, do you guys not think that the people who wrote the New Gospels for the New Testaments actually were not aware of the stuff that was going on during that time period. Because I'm pretty sure they had direct contact of the Hebrew Bible and probably, probably borrowed some elements for the whole entire legend of Jesus rising from the dead. It's entirely possible. That does not mean saying that Jesus the person does not exist. That's not me saying that. It's just saying that the story as told in the Gospels might have had some sort of inspiration from past. And so for me, it takes like a lot of evidence to actually believe that the Bible is the word of God. Because when I see so far, the Bible is far from perfect. There are various types of contradictions throughout. There are various different types of authors throughout. It's based upon copies upon copies upon copies upon copies. And obviously, the eyewitness accounts are not really reliable. And so it takes like a lot of things, like a whole lot of things, to convince me that the Bible is true. Now, I don't claim to know 
how the universe came to be. Like, I'm very much agnostic on that whole entire issue. But I know for a fact that, like, a lot of the gods throughout the ages, including the Christian God, are just, you know, man-man creation. And if the word of God is not really accurate, I cannot find myself believing that it's true. But anyway, what do you guys think? Tell me in the comment section down below. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I want to trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.